Bell Me Out Production Studios in the beautiful state of Arkansas, you're listening to the Shattered Podcast with your host, The Elias. Today with me, I have Connie Ward. Thank you, Connie. Um, we'll start, you tell me a little bit about your childhood. Um, I was actually born in Mississippi to my mother and an alcoholic father, and he was very physically abusive to her. So in fleeing him, she brought me and my brother and my sister. I don't remember any of this, but they do. They can remember him being abusive to, to her. But they, she fled and came back home to where her parents were, which was here in Dequeen. And um, after that, we stayed in a, a government apartment for a while, and she ended up getting a, a good job at Poland at the time, and which paid really good money back then, <laughs> you yeah. know. And she ended up getting a little brick home in Dequeen, you know, inside the city limits. And, you know, we just lived there for a while, and eventually she ended up meeting um, my next dad. <laughs> and he was another alcoholic, but this one was more um, emotionally and verbally abusive than physically abusive. And which can be just as bad. Um, and I think it, in some ways it's worse because, you know, you can heal from a broken arm, but right. it takes a lot of um, it takes a lot deeper types of healing. Um, Jesus can heal it all, you know, and but it was a lot. It was a lot harder, I think, especially for her, right. you know, because those lies that you're told, they can have a mm-hmm. way of working in and stay in, right. you know, and you're stuck with those lies until Jesus comes in and takes them. Mm-hmm. But um, he. I don't hold any resentments against him now. I did for a while, but <laughs> I have I have a heavenly father. That's all I need, you know. And once I come to realize that, having the resentments against an earthly father, either one of them, it just melted away. Right. You know, because they're just imperfect people, you know. They're just, I mean, they're both very much active in their addictions. And, you know, I mean, how could I hold that against them? They didn't. They didn't know any better to the extent that they were able, able or capable of doing any better. So, right. um, but he was emotionally abusive to us. If we stayed up late enough, we could hear some of the things that he would say to my mom, like, you know, those girls are just going to grow up to walk the streets and just, I mean, just horrible things, you know, right. that why would you say that to your wife's kid? You know, I mean, mm-hmm. it, it, it was just, you know, but it they lived a somewhat normal life. You know, I had friends over. They, <laughs> looking back on it now, I can see that he did meth. <laughs> I mean, it was obvious that he drank. And um, right. one time she had found, I guess it was weed underneath the mattress. And because she had, she, well, she said what it looked like. And so looking back on it now, I know what it was, but I didn't at the time. And your mom did not do any drugs oh, at no. all. She would never even smoke a cigarette, yeah. <laughs> let alone drink alcohol or anything else. So, um, but... He, he always drank. Like, that was very obvi- evident. Mm-hmm. But I can remember one time in the middle of the night, it was probably 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning, and uh, me and my sister and my brother got called out of bed to go down to the neighbor's house and look at all these fish that they had caught. And we had went down to the neighbor's house, and they had, like, a whole carport full of fish lined up. You know, like, why would you do that? Why wouldn't you just pull them out and clean them? Right. <laughs> you know, why would you line them up in the in the carport? I mean, it was just insane. And, you know, looking back on stuff like that, I can think, well, that was meth. Because, you know, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's that's not something you do when you're on alcohol. That's not a downer thing, you right. know. <laughs> that's definitely an upper thing. So. And he was very controlling. Um, very, very, very much so. I mean, and a lot of that had to do with how he was raised. He was adopted. So, I mean, I have no, I mean, he had a rough life too. I mean, it was, there there wasn't that they were good people, weren't good people. They were very good people, his parents. Mm -hmm. But, you know, he just, before they got him, I have no idea. You know, I don't know very much about it. I just know that he was adopted and that it was hard for him. Mm -hmm. And, um, but he, 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 he was very controlling and he, uh, he worked, and then he wouldn't work, and then he'd work. It was just very unsteady. But when he worked, he worked hard, and he made good money, and then it was okay, and then things would get tight, and then things would loosen back. It was just, it was steady because of my mom. Right. You know, she always worked. She always, you know, she always took care of us to the best of her ability. And he was just 
I don't know. He was just sometimes there and sometimes not. And he, when he tried, he tried, but most of the time he didn't try. I can remember asking him to take me fishing, which really was code for go spend time with me, you know, like right. be my dad. And he just, he's like, well, <laughs> she just wants to play in the water and run off all the fish or she just wants to. <laughs> my hunting was just, I had no idea. You know, I just wanted to go spend time with him and that's what he wanted to do. So I'm sitting here playing with sticks, you know, wanting to have a conversation and he's like, shh, you're running off the deer, <laughs> you know. <laughs> so, I mean, I never really had a father-daughter relationship with either one of them, right. you know. But, I mean, he did put up an effort in so much as he could, you know. Like I said, I don't I don't resent him anymore. I used to hate him. <laughs> I mean, yeah. mostly that relationship with my mother ended in him having an affair with a lady he's actually still currently married to. And um, it was just, I, I, I hated him for that. I hated him because my mom didn't deserve that. Well, you saw them. Yeah, we um, we never saw anything bad, but my sister and I actually caught the other woman dropping him off at our house that my mom was paying bills at. <laughs> you know, and it just... And they were kissing, and you thought, wait, that's not my mom. <laughs> yeah, I mean, she had curly hair like my mom, but it was not my mom. Mm-hmm. And when we figured out, oh, wow, that's not mom. Mom's at work. We, you know, of course, told our mom, and that led to them getting a divorce. Right. And um, I don't know. I mean, but he, he was. He was very, like, he would let us go and spend the night, but, I mean, he was very strict. And in a way, it was good for me because I needed that structure. Because whenever that structure was gone, I went crazy crazy but I mean he would he definitely rolled with an iron fist if we so much as forgot to lock our bikes up at night we had to write like six pages of sentences and get looks or whatever you know it was I remember one time we had climbed a tree down at the neighbor's house just climbed a tree like and it wasn't even in her yard it was in the cemetery behind her house but it was kind of overlooking her yard and she called the cops I don't know if she was scared we were gonna fall I'm not really sure why she called the police but we got licks for climbing a tree <laughs> because she called the cops you know and I guess you know when you're a drug addict you don't hmm. want cops around but right. yeah I mean he <laughs> it's, it was crazy you know the things that, that he did sometimes but you know like I said I just don't I don't if I tried to focus on stuff like that, I could become resentful, but I just don't because right. he's, he's just another person, you know. How old were you when you met a group of friends? Shortly the, after that the divorce. divorce. Yeah, that divorce, he, that structure was gone. And you were how old at that time? I can't remember if I was 11 or 12. Okay. Um, probably 11, about to turn 12, somewhere in there. But um, he was, like I said, very structured. You know, we had a bedtime. We had to take baths at this time. We had to brush our teeth by this time. Every, everything was, you know, down to five minutes was scheduled pretty much. And then when he was gone, my mother was working nights. He had, I don't know, she had went through several jobs. She had a career, and she basically left it because of his wishes. And right. she ended up just having to work like a minimum wage job at night. And... Um, And she was making pretty decent money before then, Mm -hmm. you know. But anyway, so we had no no stepdad, no mom. You know, we were at school during the day. When we got home from school, she'd go straight to work. You had no structure. There, I had no adults, (laughs) you know. I was just me and my friends and my sister and my brother. Which, you know, my brother, he did... He was a little bit older, and he was real big into football, and he loved football. And, you know, he was doing two-a-days, and he stayed active in sports and in school, and he ended up graduating. And me and my sister just dropped out to do drugs. But when that extra structure left, we didn't have, you know. We crazy. just crazy. Yeah, <laughs> we did. I mean, it was from going like this all the time to just having all this room. Right. And, um, and whenever... I always felt different. I always felt unaccepted and unwanted and unloved. I mean, I just always had all these feelings. And so whenever there was nobody there to keep all that contained, it just went wild. Right. And, of course, when you have that type of mentality, that kind of birds of a feather flock together. Mm -hmm. And so I just kind of migrated to those people. Those people migrated to me. And before I was 13, I was in full-blown addiction without even knowing it. You know, I mean, it was just. You started with alcohol. Um, that was the first thing I did, and then shortly after was pot. But, I mean, it was just within a matter of months from the time I drank to the time I was doing meth. I mean, it was – I never hung out with anybody my age, ever. You know, I mean, I was 12, hanging out with 24-year-olds, 27-year-olds. I just – I just never and never you felt accepted. Me. Yeah, I did. I felt like I was the party girl. I was the I Popular. was the cool kid. Mm-hmm. I was the 
I was accepted by then. And it created the illusion of being accepted or loved or right. wanted. I mean, looking back on it now, it was all superficial and it was all fake and it was all because of the drugs. Right. But whenever that's the type of people that you have, hang around with, I, um, I got connections and I learn to manipulate to get money or, you know, whatever. You know, I mean, that's just what, what you do then, you right. know, because it's, that's what it's all about is being outside of how you feel, mm-hmm. you know. And whether that means alcohol or whether it meant meth or whether it meant weed, like, it, that's what it was. And back then, it just started out as being accepted, but it became a way of life. I didn't – I had – done that for you know when you're 11 or 12 you don't remember much else right you know? but when I was younger my grandmother always took us to church always and eventually my mother started going too and so I kind of had a foundation I didn't know much but I knew God was good and um, I guess he had shown me that through church camp experience at one time mm-hmm. so I mean I have put it on the back burner never really thought about it and all my addiction, you know, which <laughs> I say all my addiction. I was only active in addiction for like six or seven years because God radically pulled me out of it. But I had always had a foundation, you know. I had Tell me what your what was your rock bottom? With, um, well, actually, I guess I had two. My first one, when I met God, when I met Jesus, it was um, I had gotten a fight with my mother. She wouldn't let me have her car to go do my drugging. And I didn't have a car. So, I mean, that was pretty much my only transportation. And I really wanted to go. And she, I don't guess she didn't have gas money. So she kept telling me no. And this was not a thing. You know, like I would I would always manipulate her. I was terrible to her um, to make her say yes. So she would try to say no. And then I'd just be terrible and make it easier for her to say, okay, go, than to deal with me. You right. know, that was my goal. You was a hellion. I was very, <laughs> very bad. <laughs> very, very misbehaved child. And um, I made I made her life really bad during those times. And um, anyway, she just said no this one day, and uh, she was sticking to it. I have no idea why she decided to stick to it that day, but she would not let me have my way. And I called her a terrible, terrible name, and she started crying, and she threw the keys at me and said, go. And uh, I went and got high, of course, <laughs> because that's what you do, you know. I mean, when you're that far in it, you don't deal with feelings. You don't. I mean, that just made me want to get high even more, having those all that extra emotion to deal with. Right. And so I did. I just left and got high. And um, <laughs> when I came back, um, thank you. When I came back, it was just like, just like nothing had ever happened. You know, all those feelings were just radically gone, you know, because mm-hmm. of the drugs. And so it took a couple more months, but that it kind of started a pattern. It kind of broke me. It kind of showed me that this life that I was headed toward wasn't what I wanted. And um, after that, she well, somewhere around that time, she started going back to church, and she was really praying hard for me. And, you know, Jesus came in and intervened, and that was the start of my bottom. But coming out of denial wasn't another big, big part of my bottom. I just thought that I'm just a young girl having fun. And that's what I said for, for six years. I'm just young and dumb. Well, when I about turned 18, it became a reality to me that I, I was going to be an adult. I was going to have right. real life consequences for my actions. I could no longer say I was young and dumb. And so and all this happened just within four, I mean, maybe five or six months, if that long. And had a friend that showed me that I was going to be those people, you know. I would always think about, you know, people that didn't have a home, didn't have a Mm -hmm. car, that lived underneath the bridges. And, you know, like I just had always kept myself as better than them in a separate box. Yeah, I was an addiction, but I wasn't in that addiction. And um, I had a friend that showed me that there was a yet at the end of that sentence. You're not there yet. You know, if I would have kept on going the road that I was going down, I would be right there with them. And so, I mean, having that, coming out of denial and seeing who I was and how I was and what I was becoming, I hated it. I hated myself. I hated it. And then having all that with my mom and just everything, it all just kind of snowballed. And um, and then, like I said, with mom going to church then, you know, when Jesus comes on the scene, everything changes. But... um, and she had prayed, and she was actually going to, like, call the police and, like, give me to, I don't know how she was kidding. She was planning on giving me to the police because there was nothing she could do with me anymore. I was just beyond, beyond gone. Like, I think she wanted me to, like, go to some type of a boot camp thing. I'm not right. sure exactly what she wanted, but she knew she didn't want me in the house anymore because she couldn't deal with me. Right. And <laughs> she was very right in that thought process because mm-hmm. I was on a bad, bad road. But anyways, I told her... <laughs> 
what it was was the love of God. She had went to church one day, and she had come home with this list of all the different types of love that the Bible talks about. And I read that list, and I was thinking at the top of it was like a God bay love, just the type of love that you have for every person. Mm-hmm. You know, just when you see somebody in Walmart that's hurting, when you see somebody on the – and I can remember thinking – I had that kind of love before when I was little. Right. And I didn't have it anymore. And that, when I read that paper, I told my mom, you know, I called her. I thought about it for a couple of days, and I, I called her. I was like, Mom, I can't do this. She's like, all right, we'll find you a rehab. And I <laughs> ended up going to Eagle Town to sit in Eagle Town for a few days because my aunt lived there, and it was like Eagle Town was a safe place for me. And... Um, <laughs> I know it still sounds so crazy saying that well, because it does. <laughs> <laughs> but Eagle Town was um, it was my safe place, and I stayed there until my mom found a rehab for me to go to, and then after that I went to rehab for a few days, and God lined up some crazy situations, and I ended up at a rehab. They let me in on a day that they weren't supposed to admit anybody because my mother had went to school with the administrator of that rehab, and it was actually a drug rehabilitation facility that taught, you know, secular 12 steps, AA and A. But now the the first rehab you went to. <laughs> the first rehab I went to, I actually sprang my ankle and they kicked me out. And I thought, wow, if this is God, I want no part of it. But, <laughs> but they, they also kicked you out because your mom didn't actually put you in the right rehab. Yeah, she was just trying to get me into anywhere that said they would take me. And this well, was more to, for suicidal. Yes, it was more for, like, people that would need antidepressants. It wasn't a drug facility and You all. didn't need any drugs. <laughs> no, I mean, they actually put me on antidepressants and sleep meds, which I shortly took myself after, I mean, within... Within probably a month of going to the drug rehab, I weaned myself off of everything they right. had put me on. But, um, <laughs> yeah, she at that facility, I was playing basketball. I don't know why. I'd never played basketball before. But I played basketball, sprang my ankle, and then the next day they kicked me out. They were like, Cause you got to go because you're not going to kill anybody here, and you're not trying to kill yourself. So this isn't the place for you. But I had an amazing counselor, and she finally found a place that would take the insurance that I had, which was our kids, and um, a rehab facility for drugs and alcohol. And we went... My mother went up there to talk to them, and I can't remember if it was a Tuesday and they only took people on Thursday or if it was Thursday and they only took people on Tuesday. I really can't remember, but it was one or the other. And um, they said, well, this guy is the guy that runs this facility. And Mom was like, I went to high school with that guy. Tell him to come down here and talk to me. And he came down, and he's like, look, you know, I'm going to take her against my better judgment because <laughs> this is the third time that this has happened. I've took somebody from DeQueen, and it's not panned out before. They left early and all this other <laughs> stuff. And finally he was like, yeah, I'll take her. And my mom was like, oh, thank you. <laughs> what, what's the name of the um it was rehab. recovery centers of alcohol it's rca and um i was in recovery the, centers of arkansas uh, yes sorry did i say alcohol that's, that's <laughs> <laughs> well i mean that was some of the reason you were there <laughs> yeah <laughs> but um it was rca and they just did a bunch of classes it wasn't jesus it wasn't i mean it was secular it was definitely higher power based it wasn't jesus based but <laughs> i told god you know i was like when i prayed before i went to rehab i was like there's got to be like a one, two, three step program out there for people like me mm-hmm. because I knew if I could get my hands in it, that I could mess it up. And the only way that I would be able to make it work is if it said, one, do this, two, do this, right. three, do this. And I had no idea that there was, you know, an actual one to 12 step program. I had no idea, you know. So anyways, I really needed that. I needed that structure. And we had to go to class every day and it was back to... Just learning, just learning about why it was so easy for me to be addicted and why, how those drugs affected my body. And it was, I mean, it was a really good learning experience. I kept those notes for probably a decade. How long were you there? Just a month, a month and a half. I stayed over Thanksgiving and Christmas, and then I went to the outpatient version of it. But I met Jesus in there. (laughs) He, um... There was 40-plus women, all addicts, and then on the other side of the facility, there was 30 men, and they were separated. We were all separated, Mm -hmm. of course. So I say all that to say somehow with all these addicts running around, all the staff, somehow at some point I was alone by myself smoking a cigarette. I don't know that I was ever alone any other time than this one time, but somehow I was alone. I don't even remember where everybody else was. I have no idea. I just remember sitting on this bench, you know, because the drug haze lasts for a while. (laughs) But I can remember just sitting on this bench and just talking to God and thinking, you know, you have to be real because I'm here. You know, and it was just a few weeks ago that I prayed about doing something different, and I'm doing something radically different Mm -hmm. right now. And I can, there, I have no idea. It was 
the Holy Spirit just like came inside of me and I can remember just being so overwhelmed by the goodness of God Mm -hmm. and it was like something clicked in my head it was like a brand new part of my brain opened up and I felt like no matter what happened to me I would be okay and I had never felt like that before and I was (laughs) I started jumping up and down I threw the cigarette down that I was smoking I started jumping up and down he's real he's real you know and it was just like it's amazing. And I called my mom the next day. And I was like, Mom, I got saved. And she started crying. And anyways, it was just really, really awesome. But I didn't know what happened at that time. I just knew right. that I felt okay. And I had never felt that way before. And um, it took probably two, maybe three weeks before I realized that I didn't even want to do drugs anymore. Like the desire was completely removed from me. And right. I still to this day haven't. I relapsed twice, once intentionally and once not, but that was shortly after then. Like, I've been sober for more than 12 years now, and I just I have no desire. When you relapsed, you just immediately took that step forward again. Well, one time <laughs> um, I had a sponsor that told me, if you think you don't have a problem with alcohol, go drink. And it might not be sound advice. It might be sound advice. I don't know. <laughs> I'm not sure. I haven't figured that all it out It didn't yet. work for you, well, apparently. I, well, I, I knew I'd had a problem with drugs, but I right. didn't really like alcohol. The only time I drank alcohol was if there was nothing else. And then, of course, I'd do whatever it was to make me feel well, different. Sure. But um, so I was like, okay, well, maybe I can go do some some <laughs> some what, social drinking, I guess, is what I was thinking. And it, that didn't work out too well. I, it was like, I'm going to drink two or three beers, and then I'm going to go home. I'm going to catch a taxi. I'm not going to drive. I'm going to re- be responsible. I ended up drinking, like, almost a whole 30-pack and a whole Good bottle. Lord. And uh, <laughs> I ended up, I mean, drunk, passed out. I didn't even go to sleep. I passed out at that place. And I was like, oh, I woke up the next morning with me. You know, I was still there. But this time I had, you know, all the guilt. And I was like, okay, well, obviously I have a problem with alcohol, too. <laughs> <laughs> addiction is addiction. <laughs> yes. Yes, yes, yes. I mean, and so, I mean, I was grateful looking back on it. Like, that's why I say I can't say if that was sound advice or not. Mm-hmm. I mean, I don't know that I would tell any of my sponsors that I probably right. wouldn't I probably wouldn't promote them drinking I probably would not <laughs> but, but for me it worked like I mean and it's crazy because if I hadn't have got that reservation out mm-hmm. then because it was a reservation I thought in my mind I might be okay with drinking and if I hadn't got it out then I might have had it I might have acted out on that reservation after I'd had kids right I mean it could have went I mean a lot more twisted than what it, mm-hmm. it did you know Absolutely. it ended up with one night of regret which could have been a decade of regret right. you know there's no telling how far I could have gone if I'd have done it after I'd have had five or six or seven years clean and had kids mm-hmm. and, you know so I mean I'm, I'm grateful for that sponsor and her unsound advice because <laughs> it, it worked for me you know I mean I think that's why God puts us with sponsors you know because he Holy Spirit is just so amazing and right. he, he works through people and, and God knows what you need when you need it and like I said I wouldn't say that to to any of my sponsees but she said it to me and it worked but then the next relapse I had um nine months I had like five or six when that happened with alcohol and then I had like nine months and I was at a concert that I didn't have any business being at but granted I um I didn't know Jesus then I knew that God had saved me and I was still working out the whole Right. The whole process. Like, I had a relationship with God, but I didn't know about Jesus. Like, I'd heard about him when I was younger, but I didn't. It was Like I said, what I started in was not faith-based at all. Right. I just knew that I was going to do whatever they said because what I was doing wasn't working. Right. They said, get a sponsor, I got a sponsor. They said, get a job, I got a job. They said, get a house, I got a house. You know, like, yeah. I just did everything they said because what I said, what I was saying wasn't mm-hmm. working. And what they said worked. You know, I got time anyways. So I had, like, <laughs> nine months clean, and I went to this rock concert in Little Rock and I um this mosh pit broke out beside me <laughs> and this guy fell on my knee and uh like I had to go to the emergency room and they gave me pain pills and I was like oh look <laughs> I you know and it's prescription yeah so, mm-hmm. and so I um I was like okay I'm gonna take these as prescribed I had never even really taken pills in my addiction you know I'd taken a few Xanaxes but nothing you know like they weren't really that big like they are now back then and um they were starting to get big, though. Mm-hmm. They were starting. But um, anyway, this was um, 
<laughs> I was like, okay, this is kind of cute. I guess I can take pain pills. Like, I'm, I've got this. Like, it's no big deal. Well, I took that whole bottle in two days. And I was like, okay, well, I guess I have a problem with that drug too. <laughs> you know? <laughs> so, <laughs> I mean, it was, it just, I had to find that. But I never, I didn't relapse on pot or meth again. I had no desire. Like, God completely removed that desire. And then over the next couple re- years, he removed all my reservations too. But I didn't, I didn't. I could have easily beat myself up over it. You've got nine months. I almost got kicked out of the rehab facility that I was at outpatient still. I almost got kicked out over it. and <laughs> You know, I mean, I could have really beat myself up. I could have really let myself stay down. But, I, I mean, I didn't. I picked myself back up. I saw it for what it was. It was a fall. And it happened. Mm-hmm. And I didn't. Before, I probably would have been in denial about it. Like, even tried to erase those people from my life so that I didn't have to face the reality that it happened like mm-hmm. because I'm very very hard on myself and always have been but you know I didn't there was just God's grace covered me and allowed me to pick myself back up and keep running forward and I did and I ended up getting my own place in Little Rock my grandfather helped me get a car and I stayed in that <laughs> 18 years old and I had my own apartment my own car my own job I mean I just I loved it life was amazing wow. and I was going to meetings like I Ended up being a secretary on a WIPA up there, which is young people in AA. I mean, if I'd have stayed in Little Rock, I probably would have been really big in AA because I loved it. I loved the structure of it. I found people that accepted me for me Mm -hmm. without drugs, without alcohol, without that that just, you know, could could see my heart, you know. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, it was awesome, and I loved it. And then my husband happened. (laughs) So you fell in love. Oh, I fell in love like when I was still in addiction. It's just he fell in love after I got sober. (laughs) (laughs) He didn't like the drunk me either, I don't guess. But anyways, he had started working for the railroad. And when I was in Little Rock, I had probably been up there maybe a year. I don't know, maybe more than that. For a while. Long enough to find out, start to find out who I was and Mm -hmm. find my identity in something other than drugs. And, um... Anyways, one day these days, he just decided that he was in love, and he wanted me to come in California and be with him, and I loved him. And so I was like, okay, sure. <laughs> <laughs> so I had just been building this life. I was there for 18 months. I was there for 18 months. So I had had my apartment for 18 months because I had just signed another six-month lease, like, the week before he called. And so, anyways, I waited till the wife hall was over because I had commitments. I had to show up, and I had to be a secretary, and I had to, like, mm-hmm. shuffle people around. This is, like, a 1,000 people at this conference. It was huge. Right. And so I had my adulting I had to do, and I was like, okay, I'll come to California, and we'll see what happens after I get through with my, my adult stuff. And um, <laughs> that was into that. I never came back. Um, we just... He was very active in addiction still. He did meth. I mean, oh, that was... yeah. That's that was, not good. Yeah. Well, I mean, I was radically delivered. A lot of people... And I, that's why I'm really, really careful with what I say to people when they start to get into relationships in, when they're sober. Because mm-hmm. um, you never know what God's doing. Right. You know? I mean, and it's easy to look at relationships and statistics and 90% of them end in failure and right. relapse. But there's 10% that work. Who am I to judge what does mm-hmm. and what does not? So I'm, I'm very careful with that, but I'm very careful not to promote it either. <laughs> like, you need to love Jesus before you love a guy or a right. girl. But um, anyways, I uh, was head over heels. I had loved him forever. Anyways, and we went out to California, and he was working for the railroad, and we just, it was really sick and twisted. But I still, like, in California, I would look up, meetings and I would go to meetings in California with these random people and it was really weird (laughs) it's very very weird because it wasn't like AA was kind of founded in Little Rock and so um the the groups that I went to there were very seasoned very very Uh seasoned and they they had it together they knew how to make things work and how to have different groups for this type of people because they didn't make and it wasn't like that everywhere else you know mm-hmm. it was just it was crazy <laughs> and so but anyways I um I kind of let my relationship with God go and I made my husband well he wasn't my husband then but I made him my God and it it is what it is you know it wasn't right right but I let my love for him and it wasn't it wasn't even real it wasn't godly love. It was the way that the world would teach you to love. It wasn't a healthy love. Right. Because, you know, a healthy love wouldn't have enabled him, <laughs> you know. Absolutely. And, um, but anyways, I, I did love him, and I was head over heels, and I just I put everything that I was working toward my whole life on the back burner. 
and put everything that I had into making this relationship work with him. And I never relapsed because God had really radically delivered me from all that. Um, But insofar as my recovery with the Lord and building my relationship with my higher power at the time, I completely relapsed. Like I pray, it started out, I prayed all the time. And then after a while, it was I prayed maybe once a day and then once a week. And then it got to where I went like a whole year without even acknowledging that God was there. But I didn't even have drugs to run to anymore. And I'd gotten pregnant. We had <laughs> had two babies. And, I mean, life was just, it was it was good, but it was crazy. Like, I was blessed. I can see the favor of God on my life throughout that time. But I learned the difference between being a dry drunk <laughs> and having recovery because I was miserable. Right. You know, I mean, I had been blessed. It got so crazy, you know, like... I had two amazing, healthy little boys, and I had a husband. I had, you know, I mean, I had the life that I had always wanted when I was a kid. We all, I don't know, it was it was just crazy, but mm-hmm. but I didn't I didn't have a relationship with God at that time. I had let my pers- my pursuit of a relationship with my now husband overtake everything else that I was pursuing. And he came before my relationship with God. He came before my relationship with my husband, I mean, with my kids. Right. He came before my relationship with myself. He came before every job, every everything. Mm-hmm. I, I put him on a pedestal instead of God. And that was probably five or six years of my recovery. I did that. It was, <laughs> looking back on it, 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 it's crazy. It's also even more crazy how God pulled me out of that. And that's why I say I had two bottoms is because there was one where I met God and then there was one where I met Jesus (laughs) and it was completely different. And I think the Bible talks a lot about pick up your cross, deny yourself, pick up your cross and follow Jesus. You know, and that's a lot of it. We're we're promised persecution and I didn't want that. I I hated feelings, you know, and when things got hard, it was so easy for me to give up on everything that he had done for me. And, I mean, not relapse, but just, you know, just, like, give up on that life. Like, I'm I'm not good enough to do this. I can't be one of those church ladies. I can't I can't do this and just, you know, just give up on that and then just kind of just be depression, I guess, is really what it was. What know? happened that changed all of that? <laughs> um, I had a job. I had a, I had a job that paid the bills. And I lost that job, and I went back to school and through going back to school because I lost that job right at a time when school was about to start. It's July, and school started back in August. Mm-hmm. And my grandmother kind of talked me into going back to school, and um, and I did. But I met some people when I was going back to school, and um, I started hating feeling how I was feeling. I was seeing the effects that my crazy behavior mm-hmm. and my husband's crazy behavior was having on my children. They were two, three. Wow. And um, God just put people in my life. You know, he just put people there that would say things that I needed to hear. And um, I had just got sick of it, just got sick of it, of not even being able to escape from my reality with drugs and alcohol anymore. But the reality was just as bad as it was before. Right. And so I, uh, (laughs) he put people in my life that was like, well, you know, how about you go to this church? How about you go to this church? And so I went to that church and (laughs) that's where God wanted me. And I had just kind of started I went initially, like I said, because I could see the effects on the boys. Mm -hmm. And I wanted them. I knew that 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 foundation had helped me. And so I wanted them to have that foundation. And so this church had a reputation for having strong children's programs. And so that's where we went. And then, like, two people that I had said something to about. I only said something to two people. And both these people had said this same church. And so I, um, I went. And I was weird. It was weird. I, you know, had been out of the church team for a long time. I was raised Baptist. This was Pentecostal. I was scared. People were talking (laughs) crazy. Like, it was really, really weird. But, you know, I kept thinking I only said something to two people. And these two people said this church. So I was like, I'm going to go back. And I went back, and I went back, and I kept going back. And I'd sneak in, like, <laughs> 20 minutes after it started to make sure that everybody was sitting down and nobody was up shaking hands. I didn't mm-hmm. want to talk to any of those people, <laughs> you know. And um, 
I'd sneak out before any, I made it a, a point to not let anybody see me. I tried to be invisible, but I wanted to do something different. At the same time, I just wanted to do something different unnoticed. And um, <laughs> there was these two little ladies at the back that I had to drop my kids off with. You know, I couldn't avoid them. They had to take my kids. And they were praying ladies. <laughs> and they just, I don't know, they, they prayed me in, I guess. I don't know. It just, um, I kept going and I kept going and God started working in my heart and I had I had got a conviction about getting married. I had felt like I was living out of wedlock and that God couldn't I was preventing the hand of God from working in my life by living in sin. And so I said to my husband, Now, what do you think about getting married? He's like, All right <laughs> <laughs> So like I called the pastor and I was like, Hey, will you get us married? And he's like, Yeah, sure, come up here Monday. Well, Monday was April Fool's Day. But we went and we got married on April Fool's Day. But um six months after that I had kind of stopped going to church. It was just more of an inconvenience to have to get up on Sunday mornings early and get everybody ready and my husband still wasn't going and Things just weren't going my way, and so I just kind of put it on the back burner. You know, like I still wanted to have a relationship with God. It just wasn't important again. Here we go through this again. But um, six months after we got married, I had a new job, and this guy started coming to work and was treating me how I had always wished my husband would. And um, I didn't ever actually have an affair so far as with the physical part of it, but emotionally mm -hmm. I did. And um, when that came to the surface, it wrecked me. And um, at the time I was very resentful for the people that allowed it to surface, you know, because it was very intentional. They went straight to my husband and was like, hey, she's doing this. And it wasn't out of trying to help or out of love for him. It was just out of being mad at me. And I was very mad at the time, but I'm so thankful for it now because when that happened, I had to look at myself. I had to look myself in the eyes and see who I was, see that the only thing that was good that was in me came from God. It wasn't because I wasn't using alcohol or drugs mm -hmm. anymore. I thought that because I wasn't using, I was a good person. But the only thing that was good in me was what God had put there. Mm -hmm. And um, when I came to that realization, it was just like that stronghold in my life had led me to so many crazy behaviors. Mm -hmm. At that point, I realized my need for him, for Jesus. And I realized, um, sorry, I'm a crier. <laughs> <laughs> but at that point, I realized my need for him, and I agreed to actually make him Lord of my life, right. not incorporate him into what I was doing like I had been doing all this time just become part of my life I actually agreed to follow him and do what he said and I don't know how but he um gave <laughs> he allowed my husband to forgive me somehow some type of way and um I don't know that was that was it you know I met Jesus at that point within probably six months of that I had uh, he put a love for the word in me and I would stay up every night read my bible and just learning what he said about me and mm -hmm. just cultivating a relationship with Jesus, not with a higher power anymore, with Jesus. Right. <laughs> you know, the earth changer. The, I mean, if I allow myself to think about it still, like who he says I am is just crazy. Like the maker of everything, the guy that designed a million galaxies died for me. And... It just wrecks me every time I think about it. But um, at that point, through that affair of sorts, I, I really met Jesus. And my life has never been the same since. You know, I mean, the, the, um, the chemical addictions was just part of my story. Mm -hmm. The rest of it was learning how to deal with my emotions and how to live separate from that. Right. Because regardless of how I felt, what I was going through, how my husband was treating me, regardless of how much money we did or didn't have or the things we didn't or didn't have, God was still God. Right. And, and it took me having to really look at myself to realize that, to realize that I couldn't live by how I felt anymore because even after <laughs> two decades, I still had those same feelings, those same feelings of inadequacy, those same feelings of 
not being loved and not being accepted or not being cherished or mm-hmm. not being. And when I had made my husband a God, I had looked to him to complete me in those areas. Right. But he can't. Even if he was the perfect husband, he can't be God. That's absolutely he, he right. He couldn't feel those parts of my soul mm-hmm. that needed to be filled because he wasn't God. And um, I could just look back and see what I thought I was perfect. <laughs> People that know me will think that's funny. Um, <laughs> so I still kind of do. Um, <laughs> but, you know, I thought that I was saving him. I had come off of drugs. I had come off of alcohol. I was completely functioning. I was supporting our kids even when he wasn't working. Like, I had it together, right. you know. And I thought that I was loving him perfectly. And then looking back on it, I was probably more sick and twisted than he was. And I, I just don't know how God can redeem stuff like that. But he does, you know. I mean, he has He has shown me what love really is because what God says love is and what the world says love is is completely different completely different and um, what works for some places or some people or some things I mean it doesn't always work for everybody Mm -hmm. and Holy Spirit just (laughs) Holy Spirit can filter through all that where is your relationship with your husband today um, well, he got saved uh, <laughs> a few years ago on Christmas Day, and um, that's another really great, great story. But um, So he's in <laughs> sobriety, too, as well. Yeah, I mean, he's not perfect. He's relapsed several times, and he's um, another great life lesson I had to learn is that um, I couldn't do his recovery for him, you right. know. I mean, like, when he when he got saved, he was radically it delivered. It has to be them, yes. Yeah, and... Um, I kept saying, you know, well, it wasn't enough for me. You know, I Mm -hmm. thought that because he didn't have a job and I was pushing God and I was pushing him. And it wasn't that he wasn't looking for work. There was just nothing. He couldn't find anything. And, um, hey, there was the railroad. You know, I mean, he could fall back on the railroad. And I kept pushing that and pushing that. And when I did, I basically pushed him into a relapse because it was life on the road. Right. You know, with all the same old stuff or whatever. And so I let the the fear of not being able to make it financially speak louder than his recovery. Right. You know, which granted, if I'd have known that he was going to relapse, that I, you know, I was just trying to force God's hand and force, you know, mm-hmm. God was working in his life, but it wasn't in the right way that I thought. And so I tried to make myself Lord over his life and just control everything, you know, and not let God do it how he wanted to. And so since then, he left the railroad, but God's blessed him. You know, he's put people in our life to um, bring things back to <laughs> to somewhat normal. He's, he's really blessed us. But, um, hey... Whenever I pushed him into that, it opened those doors that God had closed to those demons. And though he's still fighting, though, um, not the same things, you know, like he's still not doing any meth or anything right. like that. But, you know, the alcohol. And when society comes in and says, it's okay, you can go down the street and buy alcohol, it's really hard to accept that alcohol is, it's just as bad, you know. Anything that you turn to to escape how you're feeling or to, to do something different mm-hmm. that's not Jesus is still going to be just as bad. Right. But <laughs> I'm still just trying to let him feel out his own salvation, and I'm trying to let him it just, you know, develop his own relationship with God because mm-hmm. I can't do that, you know. And he's, he's doing so much better. Like, things aren't, like, as far as physically in our relationship, you know, like it's, it's so much better, you know. I mean, and he, <laughs> I try to define how things should be all the time, you know, like you should pray six times a day and this should be this way and we should read our Bible together and we should pray, you know, but it's not always going to be like that. And, and so I'm just trying to be supportive. I'm actually trying to be a real wife, you know, like um, support him and what he's doing. And, and I don't know, it's, my recovery or where I stand at, my my ability to be okay or to not be okay, 
is separate from him and what he's doing now. Whereas before it was always tied. If he was bad, I was bad. If he right. was going to fall, I was going to fall. And now it's just completely separate. And so whenever he's doing, like, really good, and sometimes he'll do really good, like, <laughs> the other day I came in from CR, and uh, I caught him talking to the boys about Jesus. <laughs> so, you know, I mean, it's... He's trying. Yes, he's putting up an effort, and that's that's all I want. Right. You know, I mean, and it's not perfect as I see perfect being, but I can see God's hand, and that's, that's enough for me today, you know. Absolutely. And... Um, so as of today, how long have you been clean? Uh, I don't know, over 12 years. It was um, January 19th was 12 years. Very good. And it's really crazy because that's also the date that um, I quit smoking cigarettes too. So I've quit smoking cigarettes two and a half years ago, I guess now. But yeah. On the same day. On the same day. <laughs> <laughs> Just yeah. 10 years later. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. That's It's funny how God works, but... Um, my sons were also, you know, I told you I got married on April Fool's Day. Um, my sobriety birthdays for drugs and for um, cigarettes are the same. And then my sons were born, my oldest son was born one day before my birthday. And then my next son was born two days before my birthday. So, oh, my goodness. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so dates kind of, God used dates in my life. But, yeah, September 15th, 16th, and 17th were all just bam, bam, bam. <laughs> <laughs> so... Everything right now in your life just seems to be going as you had hoped it would. I think it's better than I ever hoped for. I mean, because to wake up every day and to have a purpose, you know, to, mm-hmm. to be able to, this life is not for me. Like, I wasn't created for myself. And you're a sponsor, so you help others. Yes. And, I mean, and, and even if I didn't, that's not, I wake up accepted by the king, you mm-hmm. know, and I have an ability every situation that I step into to shine for him, you know. I mean, and that's, <laughs> Hattie bought me this shirt a couple <laughs> weeks ago, and it says, change your lives one life at a time on the back. Right. <laughs> and that's what it's all about. Mm-hmm. I mean, Every person that I step in front of, I have the ability. I am full of light. I am full of Jesus. I'm a temple created for him. And so every time I step in front of somebody, whether it be my husband or somebody in Walmart, a cashier, my kids, anybody, I have the ability to shine for him or have the ability to put a basket over my head and not shine. You know, so I mean, but I have a purpose, and that is my calling. I wasn't created for me. I wasn't created to be selfish and self-serving which is what I had lived in my whole life, is how I felt and how what I was going through. And everybody should just, like, change to make me feel better. You know, it's just self-serving ridiculousness, and it's just bondage. Right. You know, but to wake up and live for somebody else, it's freedom. And it makes no sense, but it makes perfect sense at the same time to be completely dependent on him, and everything that I do is for him. hmm you know, and so, but it's it's just an adventure all the time. Like right now, um, I'm stepping out of a ministry, and whenever um, uh, my boys have games for whenever, mm-hmm. every Friday night for Celebrate Recovery, they have baseball games. So I'm not able to do Celebrate Recovery right now. But when I go back, we're going to start um, a children's ministry for that's part of CR. It's um, Celebration Place. <laughs> and it's for kids. I think it's like five to twelve. Oh, that's great. Yeah, it's. I mean, I'm so not qualified to work with kids. Like I'm negative qualified to work for kids. I mean, with kids, but but that's what God told me to do. Right. You know. I mean, I'm not qualified to do anything that He's told me to do. But I mean, it's just an adventure. You know, working. You mm-hmm. know, like just doing what Holy Spirit says. And what month will this start? Um, I'm not sure yet. We haven't had everything working out. I mean, I'm going to go back in June. Mm-hmm. And so hopefully by the end of June, we'll have have some type of, I mean, it's got a curriculum. It's got, I mean, right. it's it's just like the Celebrate Recovery program. It actually works. Like the, the, the kids will be learning on the same areas as the adults are learning. Right. So like if the, the parents are like working on step four or step five or, you know, how to come out of, denial or whatever will it goes over the same thing on a child's level mm-hmm. in in with the children so 
but it's got curriculum and they have activities and stuff that have to be planned and you know material has to be set up and everything for right. it so um it'll take us a little bit probably to get it but i mean it's definitely something that we're looking into and absolutely I mean, it's just it's it's just so fun this life now you know it's just I don't know everything that's going to happen, and I'm okay with that now. And <laughs> I just, I love it. Good. I love it, love it, love it, love it. Well, thank you very much, Connie, for coming in today. And uh, I hope, uh, I'm proud to hear that you guys are starting the youth program with Celebrate Recovery. I think that is awesome. So we'll have to learn more about that yes. and get that out as well. Well, thank you for having me. Thank and you yes, very much. They also have a teenager curriculum, too, at some point that, you know, if we had enough people, you know, and enough. Absolutely. You know, we there's definitely more doors and definitely more room for service there. Mm-hmm. So, Plenty of room to grow. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much, Connie. Thank you.